Brew Strong is brought to you by Blickman Engineering, home of the top tier brewing stand. Visit them online at BlickmanEngineering.com. for the beer radio you've been looking for. This is the show that dispels myths, tackles the toughest topics, and makes no apologies for geeking out on beer. Hosted by two guys that drink before they think. Jamil Zainashev and John Palmer. This is Brew Strong. Hey, howdy. Hey, my brewing brothers and sisters. Hello. <laughs> Somebody told me at JBF that uh, they hadn't listened for a while, and um, they they went back to, to they needed some great podcasts to listen to when their drive had changed or whatever, and they they said they started listening to Bruce Strong again, and they were like, "Oh my God!" They said it's still so good. <laughs> said, and Palmer with his green cretins, he's got it <laughs> perfectly dialed in. Oh, nice. I thought that that was really funny. Um, it, uh, one of those cool things that uh, you get to get to do with uh, GABF and meeting the, meeting people and and talking to them. I I just love it. Yeah, um, me too. Well, and you got some trips coming up. What, what do you have uh, scheduled for the rest of the year? Anything? Well, let's see. I've got. I'm, I'm going to be back in Fort Collins in a couple weeks for a uh, library uh, literary fest there. Mm-hmm. Um, several of us, of us are going to be there. Uh, Dick Cantwell will be there. My co-author Colin Kaminsky will be there. Cool. Um, Peter Buchart uh, will be so. In the midst of all this, you know, literary talk, there's going to mm-hmm. be uh, sections on beer and coffee and tea. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, Colin and I are going to be giving some stuff on water and. That'll be fun. Um, week a- or a couple days after that, I head down to Brazil again. Mm-hmm. This time to Recife mm-hmm. in um, oh gosh, per- uh, Pernambuco, mm-hmm. uh, which is a very old Portuguese section of Brazil. Um, I guess Recife is uh, about four hundred years old. Hmm. Um, colony town, very very famous architecture, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, lots of great brewers and home brewers in Brazil. Mm-hmm. And um, always a treat going down there. Right, right. Yeah, um, for me, I've got uh, I've been on the road so much this year. I've got one more one more week to do on the road, which is uh, I'm going to be down in uh, Slow, San Luis Obispo, for a Slow Beer Week, uh, the whole week, Sunday through Saturday. And That'd then uh, yeah, that starts uh, Sunday, coming up right away. Um, and then I don't want to go anywhere for the rest of the year. <laughs> I'm going to have the <laughs> HA rally. That'll be good. And then um, I'm starting to book a trip to uh, Sweden for the Malmo Beer Fest and for their uh, their Craft Brewers Conference to speak there about yeast. Or not, yeah, yeast this time. Yep. yep. And then... Uh, I think I'm going to go to the UK and do a whole bunch of uh, hanging out with my buddies there and some collaboration brews and some events. That would be fun. Do uh, a couple of weeks of that and then back to uh, Stavanger, uh, Norway. And I'm going to speak at uh, their festival there um, on sour beer and on uh, hoppy beer. Cool. So that's going to be like a month long (laughs) trip. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, I got a bunch of bunch of stuff going on. I I'm you know I love traveling, but I really need to be home more. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Oh, well, and you know who else needs to be home more? Our ah. John Blickman. <laughs> I mean, what's that guy doing? Huh? Yeah, he's just he's putting in late nights at the factory, innovating some new ideas, mm-hmm. dreaming up new products. Mm-hmm. That's all he ever does. That and shooting. Yeah, that and shooting. Yep. <laughs> I love John Blickman. He's a good yeah. guy. He really I'm, is. But I'm always really pleased when I get a chance to hang out with him. I haven't seen him in a while. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. I think he finally included me in on some, like, hot new product. Oh, really? Cool. 
to uh, get one to try them or oh, yeah. help them develop it? Oh, he ain't going to send me some. He's pro- some. It's probably already like public knowledge. And I'm just like the last to uh, hear because I, I hate to admit it, but I haven't been going to BlickmanEngineering.com and checking to see what the new stuff is. And that's one of the cool things. Blickman Engineer will put new stuff on their website. So they're not just trying to crank out the same tired crap every time. <laughs> they are constantly innovating, taking existing products and making them better. That's taking, true. Creating new products that you never even imagined would exist. They do that on a regular basis. That's why you should go to BlickmanEngineering.com. So you're in the cutting edge of what's possible and what's, what's out there. And make sure your, your local homebrew shop knows that uh, Blickman Engineering has some of the best brew gear out there. Um, I think their stuff is fantastic. I think if you think uh, it's a little too high end for you, well, you know, they've got another, another line of gear uh, and yep. brewing products, and that is every bit as solidly built, every bit, you know, the quality may not have all the bells and whistles and be the, you know, the, the latest cutting edge, but that's quality, quality gear that you can yeah. use uh, at a lower, lower uh, entry level price point to up your game. If you're looking to, to get a great kettle, you know, if, if what you're dealing with is like an enamel pot and you want to up your up your game and yeah. uh, do full work boils and make, you know, great beer, well, Anvil Brewing could be the ticket for you if you can't afford one of them uh, really slick uh, Blickman systems. So yeah. check it out, yeah. anvilbrewing.com and uh, blickmanengineering.com, two uh, quality lines of products. And I can uh, I can vouch for them uh, wholeheartedly. Me too. All right, uh, we're gonna do Q and A. I actually enjoy the Q and A. I think yeah, that um, our listeners are quite brilliant. Um, I was talking to uh, one of our listeners at JBF, and uh, he went on and on about you know, what about this, what about that, and every single thing he said. I was like, damn, this guy's thinking things through. He's He's got some interesting takes on stuff. He's like, well, what about this? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we should talk about that. We should we should do some experiments around that. We should work out what, you know, his work through his ideas. I told him, I said, look, I'm not trying to blow you off. What I want you to do is please write each of these down in an email and send it to me. And I said, we'll work through it. We'll figure out how to do it. And he was like, well, you know, I just want, you know, I think a lot of times people think I'm blowing them off, but. Right. Oh, no. just amazing ideas. And I, I, I was, I was blown away. The guy's really thinking outside the box, but not in a crazy way. Right. And, uh, wow. I don't think anybody's thought of this before. I was, I was very impressed by this young man. Anyways, uh, if you have these great ideas, send them to Brewstrong at thebrewingnetwork.com. And uh, we'll get them on the show just like this. All right. Uh, porno, pornographic Stephen. How about yes. uh, reading us the first question? Okay. This one is about temp control free rise or force rise. Mm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey guys, I've been brewing Belgians and I've kept my fermentation in the mid 60s during the first four to five days, and then I let it free rise to the highest of the suggested fermentation range temperatures. However, I've been paranoid about letting it free rise at night because it's been around 55 degrees at night, and I don't want those cold temperatures to cause the yeast to go to sleep. Right. Should I not right. worry about the ambient temperature and just let it go, or should I strap on my firm wrap heater and force it to rise? Is one way of increasing temperature fermentation better than the other? My fermentation chamber is a repurposed freezer in my garage. Oh, I think you want to strap it on and make it rise. Yeah, definitely. More consistent uh, that way. Right. Uh, What I would say is um, you're always better controlling the temperature specifically versus just allowing the free rise of the yeast. Because yeast, you know, they will generate some heat and will cause it to free rise, but... One of the problems is, uh, like he's suggesting, when it gets colder at night, the overall temperature is going to drop. And the the yeast aren't producing more heat just because it's getting colder at night. 
No, um, no. They're you know they're just cranking out the amount of heat that they're going to going to generate based on uh, you know consuming the sugars that are available to them. But uh, so you're much better off controlling the temperature specifically, whether it's cold or warm. Um, I think in a lot of uh, my articles in BYO and other places, I would say, well, you know, let it free rise. Because a lot of people didn't have temperature control, but ideally you want temperature control. You want to specifically control what temperature you're at. Um, yeah. I think that makes free, a big difference. Free rise works best if you've got you know, a room that is consistently at one temperature. I mean, you know, very insulated. It's not going to vary with day or night. Um, you know, then then free free rise as a method works better. But as you say, Jamil, I think ideally you want to be independent of mm-hmm. uh, the environment mm-hmm. and uh, really control it. Right. Right. Yep. All right. Good question, though. All right, let's do this. Let's take a short break. When we come back, I will have another beer in front of me, and uh, we will have another question in front of uh, Pornographic Stephen right after this. The 21st Amendment. Watch out! Do you like beer? They make beer. Watch out! Do you like friends and fun? They make friends and fun. Watch out! Do you still like to have a good time? The 21st Amendment. Watch out! The 21st Amendment in San Francisco, located at 563 2nd Street, two blocks from the building where baseball is seen and played. Try their beers in the pub or try them in the can. Featuring... Monk's Blood. Made with real monk. Watch out! So why not have the best time of your life? Go to the 21A and Sean O'Sullivan will personally greet you with a can of... Monk's Blood. The 21st Amendment. Watch out! This advertisement is not in any way affiliated nor associated with the 21st Amendment Bar and Pub, nor its subsidiaries or affiliates. This telecast is not copywritten by the 21st Amendment for the private use of the Brewing Network. Any use of this telecast without Jamil Zanishev's consent is prohibited. Suck it, JP. Your support of the Brewing Network means everything to us. We couldn't produce shows without you. And we love giving you something extra for that support, like... Brew Your Own Magazine. You already know it's a great brewing magazine full of recipes, equipment how-tos, discussions of beer styles, and brewing techniques. Whether you're new to brewing and just starting out or you're an old pro, you'll always learn something from the articles in Brew Your Own. Plus, there are amazing special issues like plans for building a Brutus 10 system, 250 classic clone recipes, and the Home Brewer's Answer Book. Brew Your Own Magazine and BYO.com are awesome resources for any brewer whether for yourself or as a gift when you subscribe or resubscribe from the brewing network homepage, you directly support programs like this get a great magazine and support the brewing network subscribe to brew your own right from the brewing network.com the vault created by white labs The Vault is a collection of new, creative, and unique yeast strains from around the world. These strains have never been available to homebrewers. Most have not even been available to professionals. You have the power to release the yeast. Through The Vault, White Labs is giving you the power to decide which strains are put into production and giving you the opportunity to brew with these strains. Visit whitelabs.com slash the vault and pre-order the yeast strain of your choice and encourage your friends to do the same. Once 250 pre-orders have been achieved, White Labs will put that strain into production. The strain will be mailed directly to your doorstep, ready to make the beer you've always wanted to brew. This program was created with the home brewer in mind. White Labs is relying on you to help release these strains, which may blaze the way for future new and unique beers. Help release the yeast. Visit whitelabs.com slash the vault. Back to the beer guys that make other beer guys look like wine guys. Brew strong. All right, we're back. I'll tell you, one of the, the prime reasons to go to GABF is the Brewing Network has a booth there every year, and you can see yep. Bevo. Huh? And Sam. Uh, yeah, he's there too. Uh, yeah. But wouldn't you like to see Bebo? I'm telling you, go to GABF. Oh, she's kind oh, of blushing. Come on. Oh. oh, she's awesome. You get to talk to her, buy buy some merchandise. 
And as long as you're not like a skeezy fool, <laughs> she'll she'll give you the she'll letter. Show that very, dazzling very, smile. She'll show you that dazzling smile. Yes, absolutely. I'm even nice to the skeezy ones. You are, as long as they're not like grabby or anything. Mind yourself. Be it's a true. proper gentleman, and you'll be fine. And Bevo will be uh, lovely. Bevo will be there. That's a, a tip to all those who are thinking about going to GABF. There's your extra reason to go right there. Well, and uh, the catalyst, John. Ah, the catalyst. That's a pretty nifty system. Yeah. It's ultra compact conical fermenter that uh, they've got a stand for it that you could put this thing on your kitchen counter. You could put it in your, your fermentation fridge made of plastic. And I know people are like, oh, plastic, it scratches. Yeah, but this plastic, it's 90% more scratch resistant than other plastic conicals and 71% less oxygen permeable. That's an important fact. It's a, a, a breeze to clean because the whole lid comes off. And it's a breeze to collect yeast for your next pitch because the they've got a three-inch butterfly valve on the bottom. All those, uh, a lot of the, the, the stainless conicals that were made were like, you know, half inch or one inch. It's a three inch. You screw a mason jar on there, open that valve, and there's your slug of yeast for your next pitch, pitch of, uh, your next pitch for brewing. Yep. And, uh, I think it's very cool. And you can, uh, hit that with some pretty damn hot water and, uh, sanitize the whole thing. So I think it's, it, it hits on all points. Uh, you can learn more at craftabrew.com if you're interested. All right. What's our next question there, Stephen? This one's about mash temperature, starting gravity, and attenuation from your BYO articles. Oh, God. I knew this would come back to haunt me. <laughs> I knew it would. <laughs> All right. I was just reading the BYO Stout Style Guide Edition with articles written by your surely age male. Regarding mash temps, Jamil mentions to use a lower mash temperature when using lower attenuating yeasts or mm-hmm. high starting gravities and use a higher mash temperature when using higher attenuating yeasts mm-hmm. or lower starting gravity beers. Mm-hmm. I know that mash temperature affects the different sugars available for fermentation and results in lighter or fuller body, but I was unaware of this triangle link between mash temp, yeast attenuation, and starting gravity. Mm-hmm. Can you please expand on this idea a bit more so I can better understand what's going on here? As an example, what would happen if I have a high starting gravity, a high attenuating yeast, and I want to control the fullness or dryness by using mash temp? Well, you know, it's... it's um, the, three, the three pillars of the, uh, the triangle. No, um, the holy triangle. The holy triangle, yes. The holy trinity. Um, uh, you know, I thought it was is very clear what I meant when I wrote that initially, but maybe it isn't. Um, so I, I put that sentence in on a lot of the BYO articles because I'm really um, trying to convey a concept that, you know, a beer should finish full or a beer should finish, you know, not so full. A beer should attenuate more or attenuate less. And, you know, the the three levers, like John likes to say, are, uh, you know, your starting gravity, uh, your the attenuation of your yeast, and your mash temp. Those are pretty much, I mean, assuming you're doing good nutrients and all that, those are the three levers that are going to determine what the final gravity is uh, of, of that beer. So uh, increasing your starting gravity, pushing that lever up, to higher starting gravity is going to result generally in a fuller uh, finishing beer. Well, if you don't want it to finish too full, you can pull back on the attenuation lever, you know, getting it to attenuate more or, uh, or pushing that one forward, I guess. I don't know. I'm losing track of my metaphor here. Uh, or, you know, you can dial down on your mash temperature, all those things, or use a simple sugar. All those things will, uh, you know, dry it out more so that higher starting gravity still finishes light and easy. We do this in our uh, evil cousin, lower mash temperature. Uh, we use some simple sugars, 
and um, we use a fairly attenuative yeast. If, on the other hand, you're making a smaller beer and you still want it to like an ordinary bitter, but you still want to get some fullness of of, of character body. and body on mm-hmm. this, um, you can up your your lever of mash temperature. We go up to uh, 158. I know uh, Lagunitas uses uh, 160 at times um, uh, in order to uh, increase your, your residual there, your, your long-chain sugars, your dextrins. And you could use a less attenuative yeast also to leave more behind. Uh, so, you know, those are kind of the three levers that you get to play with in order to uh, develop what what it is you want. If you wanted, you know, something super thin and bone dry, you'd do with low starting gravity. You'd replace some with sugar, simple sugars, some of the malt. You'd use a highly attenuative yeast, and you would um, use a low mash tub. And you could get something really dry out. Or, you know, the converse, you could go high uh, gravity, um, high mash temp, and a really low attenuating yeast, and you get something thick and sweet and and silky. Yeah. Jamil, let me let me see if I can pull something out of this here. Um, one, another thing that you're saying is that when, when you're doing this, um, use all three factors together. Don't try to mix them. Because then you might get get kind of mixed results, you know. So you're saying low, low, low to mm-hmm. get a very dry beer, uh-huh, or uh-huh. you know, high, high, high for a much fuller bodied beer. Right. Um, if you try to mix the factors, then well, you may not get the character that you're actually looking for. Um, sure. Um, well, and I think it was used in these in this context of the BYO articles where you'd have a. Uh, you know, maybe a high gravity style, and yeah. you want to make sure it attenuated well enough. Yeah. So, um, if you're picking a, if the yeast you want to use doesn't have as much attenuation as some of the others, you better lower that mash temp down and maybe think about some simple sugars. Yes. Yes. In, in some I of agree. the articles, you were making a uh, you were making a mild. And one of the problems a lot of miles suffer from is, you know, it's just thin, watery, and doesn't have enough, you know, character to it. Um, right. You know, that's because it's a low-gravity beer. Well, you know, I, I would suggest some yeasts. And, you know, there's yeast with like 60% attenuation, 62, 64, 65. Well, now you can still get some of the character, but with this other yeast, it's more common but it's like, you know, 75% attenuation. Well, if you're going to use that yeast, you darn well better increase your mash temperature to kind of counter that, that uh, you know, attenuation level. Okay, yeah. yeah. So I, I think you can mix them. It's, it's just, you know, you have to kind of get a sense of what it is you're trying to achieve. And then, um, you know, start with Brewing Classic Styles. <laughs> Hey, and then, go. and then, if if your yeast is going to be more attenuative than the yeast that we say there, ah, okay, maybe up the mash temperature a little bit. Uh, if, if your uh, starting gravity is going to be high on you know some big beer, ooh, you know maybe you lower your mash temperature a little bit, get a little more attenuation so it doesn't finish too too sweet. So that was kind of my my thing. I thought it came across well explained, but. Perhaps not. So I thought it was a good question. Yep, good follow-up. All right. Uh, next question. All right. This one's about um, the Lamott pH meter. Um, this guy was honestly disappointed that his resolution for the product was at best plus or minus 10 parts per million. He bought into the whole long run over several brew batches was cheaper than using XYZ Lab. And didn't realize he'd be giving up so much resolution. Um, he recently heard you say that plus or minus 10 ppm is good enough to let me uh, get me in the ballpark. But at $170, I think I deserve just a bit more than a foul ball. Instructions for the tests have <laughs> formulations for 25 ppm and 10 ppm resolutions. And the relationship seems to suggest one could deviate formulas for deeper resolutions given those two points. Is this correct? What are these resolution formulas? Will the reagents function properly beyond 10 ppm? No. No, you you can't. There's There aren't any formulas for uh, 
higher resolution. Um, what they're talking about is how much you're diluting um, the indicators, uh, the color change indicators when you're doing the, the titrations. Um, they do sell the Brew Lab Pro, which Jamil has, um, for considerably more money that does have, um, I guess, smaller drops in the titration, which would give uh, a little better resolution. But um, really, there's no point in it. Um, 10 ppm is adequate. You will see resolu finer resolutions down to 1 ppm um, with uh, products such as the iDip. But really, that's uh, that's kind of a false resolution. Mm -hmm. um, the you know it says you know 251 ppm, but that is not the accuracy mm -hmm. of that test. Mm -hmm. The accuracy is pl you know like plus or minus five, plus or minus ten or more. Mm -hmm. So not a lot of difference really between uh, right. resolutions of these various products. I don't think the iDip is any more accurate than the Lamotte. No, I don't think so either. I, I think the Lamont is highly accurate, and I think that desiring more accuracy than the Lamont gives you, I think you're chasing down ghosts. You're you're looking in the wrong direction. Like I say, and and one of the things that freaks me out is people like so focused on, well, you know, is it two fifty one? Uh, you know, parts per million gypsum or 252. <gasps> that was 252. I went way too much. It's like, that's meaningless. You could vary by 50 and probably not taste the difference. Right. Uh, you know, you should be looking at yeast and, you know, fermentation and all that stuff. Uh, and I think the Lamotte, for me, uh, I, I, I tell you, if... You know, money's no object on, you know, brewing the best beer possible. I think the Lamont is right in there. I'm yeah. very happy with it. Me too. It's um, it, it's easy to use. It's robust, mm -hmm. um, which is, is important when you're trying to, you know, be consistent. Uh, it's, you know, it's a good product. I, the iDip is a good product as well. But yeah, um, I don't see I don't see a real cost benefit. You know, uh, and turn over the Lamotte Brew Lab uh, to using it. it. It's it's a little faster. You know, right. Put right. in a couple drops. Yeah, so I, th I, th I think uh, you know if you're you know money is no object and you need something simpler, the I Dip will do a lot of calculation for you, and it's a little simpler. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I'm, hey, you know, paint me old school. I like the Lamotte. Same here. Yeah, and I, I I think the resolution is great. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, you're talking parts per million. You're not talking like, yeah. you know, pounds. You're not talking right. like kilos. You're talking parts per million. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're chasing ghosts, like Jamil says, if yeah. you're trying to get, do better than that. All right. Anything else to add to that? Nope. All right. Well, now let's take another short break, and when we come back, we will have uh, more of your questions right after this. Hey there, BN Army. Have you heard the latest at Hop Tech? Since Hop Tech has doubled in size after a huge expansion, Jade and Roberto can stock even more of the best quality home brewing supplies and equipment. Over 60 kick-ass varieties of hops and malts, monster truckloads of quality brewer's yeast, including white labs, Y yeast, and multiple dry yeasts. They even have all grain systems from Grain Fathers and Ruby Street Brew Systems, thanks to Jade, the brand new all-grain brewer. And don't forget about their 10% discount to all BN Army members. Jade and Roberto are waiting for you and all of your brewing questions over at HopTech.com. HopTech, totally not sucking since 1983. Hey, my 
Fine Brewing brothers and sisters, this is Jamel Zanishev, and I want to tell you about Heretic Evil Twin. You might be familiar with my homebrew recipe, which uses massive late hopping to create a balance between the malty sweet and the hoppy bitter, along with an outrageous malt and hop character. I wanted a beer with the same bold hop and malt character, so we played around with the homebrew recipe until we are able to make a great commercial version, too. We've created a beer rich in malt character, full of caramel, toast, biscuit, and an ever-so-subtle roast note. On top of that, we piled in an insane amount of citra and Columbus hops at the end of the boil, as well as in dry hopping. This damn-the-cost approach to hopping gives Heretic's Evil Twin a great blast of citrus and tropical fruit that can't be matched by any other hop. The result is a bold, malty, hoppy, but easy-drinking beer. This is our top seller, our flagship beer, and I couldn't be prouder of it. Cheers. To find Heretic Beers near you, click on Find Some at hereticbrewing.com. Ken Grossman of Sierra Nevada Brewing Company says making great beer is hard. Making the same great beer every day is harder. Brewers Publications announces its latest release for breweries of any type and size. Quality Management, an essential guide for brewers by Mary Pelletieri. Proper quality management for small, regional, and national breweries is critical. Whether you are an established business or brand new, learn the best ways to create and manage a quality system in your brewery. This book will guide you in developing a comprehensive program that will grow with your brewery, help ensure quality processes in the brewery, and continue providing great beer for your fans. Quality management for breweries is critical for continued success. This guidebook teaches you to integrate quality management in every level of the operation. It will guide you in developing a comprehensive program to ensure quality processes in your brewery. Quality management, an essential guide for brewers, now available from Brewers Publications. Learn more at brewerspublications.com. If you work in retail sales, the restaurant industry, or are a new craft beer enthusiast, or you know someone who is, you have got to check out Beer 101. Beer 101 is an online course created for anyone wanting a quick introduction to the vast world of craft beer. Beer 101 covers the history of beer, brewing ingredients and processes, vital stats like ABV, SRM, IBU and gravity, styles, tasting, glassware, and pairing beer with food. The Beer 101 course is offered by the Brewers Association at craftbeer.com, also home to the truly awesome Beer Style Finder, a visual guide to every beer style. Quickly play with color, bitterness, and alcohol content to interactively explore the entire world of beer styles with a gorgeously designed interface to your favorite beverage. The new Beer 101 course and new Beer Style Finder are only available at craftbeer.com. Craftbeer.com, celebrating the best of American beer. Back to the two guys that know how to turn beer into beer. This is Brew Strong. All right, we're back, and I want to tell you about WilliamsBrewing.com. I've used WilliamsBrewing.com uh, since I started as a home brewer. They've got a really wide selection of stuff, and one of the things I think is really rocks about these guys is you get your order in before 4 p.m. Pacific time, they ship it out that same day. Not like, oh, yeah, we'll go out tomorrow, we'll go out next week. Weekdays before 4 p.m., they get it out which I think is really cool. And they have a real cool, efficient uh, fly sparging uh, tool, which is the uh, Brewer's Edge electric mash water heater. Plug it in anywhere, and this thing is going to give you precise strike and uh, sparge water uh, temperatures without all the propane, without, uh, you know, briquettes, coal, whatever you're using, uh, diesel fuel. Uh, it'll make your mashing easy. So check them out, williamsbrewing.com. All right, next question. Okay. Apparently this guy's beer temporarily smells like ramen noodles. Oh. <laughs> who, Where have we heard that before? Who doesn't <laughs> smell like ramen noodles? Who, who, who doesn't? Beba's raising her hand. She doesn't think she smells like... <laughs> All right, well, this guy, uh, his beers with Maris Otter British Two Row seem to give off an odd, raw ramen noodle odor. If I stick a spoon and stir twice, the smell is gone by the time the beer settles down. What is this? Even on new tap lines, this occurs. 
Mm. He uses San Diego Super Yeast, beers on tap, all grain 90 minutes, and I don't have this issue with my American two-row double IPAs with the same yeast. The smell really comes through when drinking immediately after the pour and isn't really pleasant. He's afraid to bottle a beer and share for the fear that he has to explain the whole spoon technique. Spooning. <laughs> explain <laughs> why the spooning. <laughs> Good one, John. Uh, you know, I wonder about this. Um, I mean, is he just mistaking, you know, a great uh, malty character with ramen? I mean, ramen noodles. Um, kind of a wheat, savory. Right, right. So it's not the yeast because he's using the same yeast. Yeah, I mean, the o- o- O90 can, can produce a little bit more malty character. Um, then, Does it give off more sulfur than other yeasts? Is that part of the uh, the malt component? Do you suppose? Well, see, I, I always there's there's an interesting website that puts uh, you know correlations. They they show graphs. There's they they came up with a, uh, a thing that searches data, um, and like there'll be um, <clears throat> like the amount of cheese consumed versus drownings and so uh you know the the two graphs just track each other surprisingly well and uh so they have a bunch of these and it's just all these nonsensical uh correlations between data points and just because the graphs match doesn't mean and there's one like you know this one actor the number of movies he's in versus like suicides and they track perfectly and, you know, one doesn't have any it, – it's just a coincidence. So you might wonder in this case it might be something else. It might be, well, you know, he's doing something else slightly different on those batches because he's thinking, oh, well, it's, you know, this special Marisotter malt. I'm going to do something different. And that could, that could actually be, uh, you know, part of the problem. Right, um, the factor. Right, right. right. Or – you know, he's like, oh, I use this this malt, and you know, he's smelling extra deep, and it's like, oh, you know, it's it's problematic. So I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, without uh, actually smelling it, yeah, without tasting it ourselves, it's it's hard to say if there's actually an issue, or it's something that um, you know he's bringing up, you know, in his mind, or it's something that, uh, you know, was performing differently in his, uh, you know, uh, brew house. I think in general, um, there's no problem with using a, 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 a nice British uh, pale ale malt made from Maris Otter. I think it, 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 it's not the grain, it's something around it. Right, because you've used, you know, a, a, a fine floor malted Maris Otter and not had any problems, right? Right. Yeah. I I I, I just wondered. I haven't I haven't brewed a San Diego Super Yeast, so um, that's the one unknown in my mind. And maybe I'm I'm kind of speculating that mm-hmm. you know there is some compound that Maris Otter variety doesn't have over say was it Harrington or whatever right. Copeland. Copeland, I guess we're brewing with these days, American two row, uh, that you know could could have an additional sulfur character mm-hmm. or ester or something that's uh, that he's experiencing. Um, I don't put the ramen in the sulfury estery though. Yeah, I, or the yeah, bready. Typically, typically, you wouldn't. Yeah. 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 So I think maybe so. he's just picking up more malt character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Send us in some beers. There you go. Hey, you could send it into Doctor Homebrew. Doctor Homebrew. There you go. Check out Doctor Homebrew. A uh, lot of lot of great shows on the Brewing Network, and they're all for free. Doctor Homebrew. There's the Sour Hour. There's the Session. There's the uh, used to be the Jamel Show. Still is the Jamel Show, but also the Brewing with Style and Brew Strong. So check them out. Lots of good stuff there. And you can send in beers to Doctor Homebrew, and uh, they can give you. Uh, a thing on it, or uh, we could check it out for you. I'm cool with either. You know what else I'm cool with is the AHA Brew uh, Guru. That little wondrous little app. Yeah, isn't that cool? It you is. You can very quickly 
discern what brew pubs, breweries, and homebrew shops are near you. And even then, more resolution, you can tell which ones are giving you an AHA discount. So if you're an AHA member, oh, makes perfect sense to, to download the Brew Guru app. You can get it from all the, the usual locations, uh, wherever you get your apps from. There, it works on all the devices, and it's free. Uh, even if you're not a member, it's free. You can check it out real quick. Uh, but if you're a member, it gives you a bunch of extra stuff. And uh, you also get, uh, you know, lots of uh, uh, recipes and other uh, vetted information that the AHA has available to them. So check it out, Brew Guru uh, from the AHA. Just uh, go to the Play Store, the Apple the App Store, and uh, uh, search for Brew Guru and, and give it a shot. I find, and, and I tell you, I'm real picky. Even with free stuff, I am one pricky, picky <laughs> Real picky uh, MFR, and uh, I would not waste bits on my phone for you know some crap app. But uh, the Brute Guru, I actually like it. It is snappy and useful. I find that uh, quite the nice thing to use. All right, next question, uh, Mister uh, Stefan. All right, this one's about wet hops in the bottle. Hmm. Um. So Joe did not get a good yield from his hop plants this year. Oh, and he was thinking, Joe. I know, he was thinking of throwing the wet hops directly into bottles and then bottling from the keg with cold carbonated beer. Hmm. Can he expect <laughs> to get any good extraction from the hops under these conditions? How long is too long? He's going to get some fountaining as well as he's going to get. Probably. Well, all right. So get some fountaining from what is it bacteria is it uh something else that, that's a concern because if you threw it into the the whole tank or the whole carboy or fermenter or whatever um you can get some fountain in that way too right right, right. Uh, but I, yeah what I, what i meant was that if you put a hop into the bottle or even a couple of hops into the bottle nucleation and sites nucleation what, sites it's right. gonna foam like crazy right and uh yeah, that's going to be a mess. You've, there's some wonderful videos on the internet, um, <laughs> YouTube and otherwise, of when after dry hopping, uh, a beer just cascading down the sides. Mm-hmm. Uh, does that ever happen to you, Jamil? Not me. However, and I'm not supposed to reveal this, uh, our wonderful head brewer, Chris, Chris Kennedy, went up to it, one of our 120-barrel fermenters, Phil Cousin, Threw in hops and somehow was not able to get the the port cover back on, and it <laughs> geysered uh, <laughs> and hit the ceiling in a you know six or eight inch column of liquid and foam. <laughs> hit the ceiling, soaked all the insulation in there, and lost about ten barrels of beer. And uh, <laughs> I'm not supposed to tell anybody that, but uh, you know. I had a few beers. Yeah, it's a go. it's a lovely sight yes. unless it's unless yeah. it's your beer. He was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> so now we, you know, have a different procedure. But eh, you know, that's that's the kind of crap that happens. You, know, you can't you can't uh, freak out about it. Yeah, you know, I think uh, you know throwing a hop cone or a couple of hop cones in a bottle. Uh, I don't think that's the way to go. I, I really don't. I think, uh, like John's saying, you're going to get uh, some geysering. And, you know, if you want to save the bottle a little longer, you're going to get, you know, this real uh, vegetal, um, you know. Yeah. Uh, or, or grassy. Yeah, grassy. It, it's not going to be good. You know, yeah. you're you're ticking time bombs at that point. So I would. A uh, Randall would be a good option. Oh, there you go. Yeah, put put the put the wet hops inside a oh, kind of like your uh, carbon filter mm-hmm. canister, and make mm-hmm. a Randall out of it, where you run right. the run the pressurized beer through that, be, you know, at the tap. Right, and, and pour it that way. You know, if you're drinking at home, it'll sit in there for a while before you pull your next pint. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. 
I'd keep it cold, though. I wouldn't yeah. uh, keep it room temperature. All right. Uh, White Lab's vault. I don't know if you know, but uh, White Lab's been collecting yeast from all over the world for a good 20 years. Like ninjas. Like ninjas they've been collecting. And uh, most of the times you, you just have no access to it as a home brewer. But what they've got now is this vault program where you go and you pre-order. There's a list of uh, available yeasts, and you you select and you say, "Well, this one, I'm gonna. I, this is the one I want." And you put your pre-order in. Get all your friends from your homebrew club. You know, get get you know, go on the internet and say, "Hey." Why don't we all get this one? This is the reason why we should all be getting this yeast. You get enough people, if it's the winner uh, out of that vault selection, they'll produce that yeast for you and send it to you. And uh, you get to try yeasts that uh, are just not available to anyone. So I think it's really cool. Check it out. Uh, you can go to uh, whitelabs.com and uh, check that uh, uh, whitelabs.com forward slash uh, vault, the vault. And uh, put your order in today. All right. Uh, next question, steve All right. This one's from Jesse. Hey, Jamil and John, I've got an equipment question for you. I recently acquired a used Angram CQ model hand pump, and it's been sitting for quite a few years. It is a standard model with a short swan neck. It does not have a sparkler or the optional water-jacketed cylinder. Mm. Is there anything I should do or worry about replacing besides the hoses and giving a thorough run through with PBW, liquid line cleaner, and star sam? I'll be making my first cast scale shortly to make use of my newly acquired gadget. Right, so I use Angram pumps as well. They're, they're kind of the Cadillac of pumps. Um, Ah, uh, you know, if it's from an unknown area, I would disassemble the whole thing. It's it's actually a glass cylinder. Um, there is a, uh, a plastic um, uh, piston that has a, a rubber wiper valve or a wiper seal around it. And then there's flappers on the, the plastic piston. And those seals can go over time, especially if they've been sitting a long time and drying out. Um, you can buy all those parts. They'll, they'll sell you the individual little flapper valves and stuff. Um, so it might be worth... The first thing I would do is fill it up with you know PB, hot PBW and run it through and see if it will actually operate properly. Um, sometimes they dry out and, and and fail and then you don't get a seal and it just kind of slops back and forth and it doesn't actually pump anything. If you have not tried that, I would try that first. Um, but I would not ever abandon any Angram that is in majority in, in intact because again, you can get all the, the parts for it. Once you have all the parts, it'll dispense a million pints before it, any parts fail. Very reliable uh, piece of equipment. As far as a sparkler, you can order sparklers uh, separately. They're like, you know, between four and six bucks. I think you can get them on eBay, you know, just one at a time if you want. A um, little plastic piece screws on there. There are different kinds of sparklers with uh, different hole patterns. Um, I personally, I would buy every hole pattern you can get and try them all. Um, I'm I'm a big fan of sparklers, uh, believe it or not. Um, you can go without it. Some people like that. I like the uh, the character that is developed using a sparkler. Um, but yeah, I would you know just give it a try and see how well it works with water or PBW. And then if it's failing, you have to take it apart anyways. If it's not failing, you can take it apart and just. Make sure everything's 100% clean, uh, and then you're you're good to go. It's it's real simple. I mean, all just there's two plates that bolt onto the glass cylinder, and uh, the the piston that goes up and down. You can take it apart, and never having seen one before, you can take it apart in 15 20 minutes, and then just you know it goes back about the same amount of time. Never having seen one, if you really know them inside and out, I bet you you do it in five. So, 
Give it a shot. John, you got anything to add to that? or? No, I've never really played with one of those. So that's... Yeah, they're a well-built piece of equipment. They're, they're meant to do millions and millions of pints. And um, the parts are available for them. Um, boy, what's the... Uh, there's a dude um, on the East Coast that provides uh, cask uh, equipment. Um, can't think of it. UK cask supplies or something like that. But they've got a bunch of Angram parts. They even have exploded diagrams of the Angram beer engine. And you can identify the parts from that. And Yeah, maybe Bevo can look it up for us for the end of the show. UK Porter Brewing. Graphic. There you go. UK Brewing. UKBrewing.com. There you go. That's it. All the, the cast parts. I suppose so. Yep. yep. UK yeah, Brewing Supplies. It. UK Brewing Supplies. So check them out. Uh, they're on the East Coast, and they've they've got new beer engines. They got rebuilt ones, and the reason rebuilt ones are available is because, dang, these things are built like tanks, and you can rebuild them and use them. You know, pass them down to your grandchildren. You won't outlast this this beer engine. I've got one that's not quite uh, pumping properly. All it needs. <laughs> few little few little flapper parts and you're you're good to go. And it'll do another million pints easily. So uh Angram's a good good choice. All right, let's take one more break. Uh when we come back uh, we'll have more of your questions right after this. Are you looking for a simple brewing system that's great for all grain brewing, but everything on the market seems to be full of compromises? Blickman Engineering has the answer. The Blickman Brew Easy All Grain Brewing System. The Brew Easy is a complete system with easy upgrades and a beautiful compact design, perfect for any size brewing location. At its core, the Brew Easy is built on two gorgeous Blickman Boilermaker brew kettles, a high temperature March pump, and either a top tier gas burner or the new boil coil electric heater. The the Brew Easy adapter lid allows the pots to stack on top of each other, forming an efficient, strong, and compact brewing setup that comes in 5, 10, and 20 gallon batch sizes. Upgrade your Brew Easy system with full automated control by adding a Blickman Tower of Power temp controller and make moving around easy with the Blickman kettle cart. The Brew Easy is modular. If you already own a Boilermaker kettle, you can build your Brew Easy by purchasing just the modules you need. The new Brew Easy all grain brewing system. See it today at BlickmanEngineering.com and Brew with with Blickman quality on your new Brew Easy. Since the first time the Brewing Network microphones turned on, more beer was behind it. More Beer sponsors the programming on the BN because, like you, they love brewing. And like the Brewing Network, they love sharing their knowledge. MoreBeer.com isn't just a website to place your next equipment or ingredient order. MoreBeer.com also gives you access to free beer information that will make you a better brewer. Go to MoreBeer.com and click into the Learning Center. You'll find podcasts, technical facts, video tutorials, and more, including access to The Buzz, more beer social network of more than 5,000 members. And some of them might even be crazier about beer than you are. Get over to morebeer.com today and take advantage of the buzz, the forum, the learning center, and make sure you're signed up to receive the newest More Beer catalog. More Beer, bringing you absolutely everything for beer making. When I order a beer, I want my server to know more about it than I do. I want someone who enjoys good beer and loves helping others enjoy it, too. I want someone who knows how to pour a perfect pint for every beer style. I want a Cicerone. The Cicerone Certification Program is creating the type of people who help you enjoy great beer. Home brewers and craft beer lovers know beer is more flavorful and complex than ever, and it takes some serious knowledge to store and serve beer right. Cicerones know beer. There are three levels in the Cicerone Program. Certified Beer Server, Certified Cicerone, and Master Cicerone. Cicerones are truly the sommeliers of beer. The best beer locations have a certified Cicerone on staff. Relaxed and unpretentious. Cicerones are tested on storing and serving beer, beer styles, flavor and tasting, the brewing process and ingredients, and pairing food with beer. Learn more about your next beer guide at Cicerone.org. Certified Cicerone because it takes top talent to present a perfect pint. Learn 
Morning to Brew has never been so disgusting. This is Brew Strong. All right, we're back. I want to tell you about our good friends at AdamandEve.com. Good people with uh, great prices, great products. I'll tell you, if you got somebody you love in your life and you're uh, getting intimate with them, here's an opportunity you shouldn't pass up to be a little bit more adventurous and creative. You can use the offer code Jamel, J-A-M-I-L, at AdamandEve.com. All you're going to pay, you put one item in your cart, 50% of that price. You're going to cut that price in half. You're going to get three free adult DVDs. If you're choosing, you're going to get a free Power O vibrating ring and free shipping. So all you're paying is just the 50%. You're getting the item half price. I think that's a hell of a deal. So check them out, uh, adamandeve.com. Use the offer code Jamel, J-A-M-I-L. You're going to get the uh, the free DVDs, the free uh, vibrating O-ring, the free shipping, just for buying one thing at half price. It's a great deal. Check it out. Share it with your loved one today. All right. Uh, what do we got left in questions? All right. This one's directly at you. Jay-Z. <laughs> If your commercial brewing career uh-huh. came to a, a abrupt end today, <laughs> just yeah. train wreck, yes, brewery blows up, uh huh, whatever, and it was back to the garage tomorrow. What is the one pro tool slash pro technique or pro philosophy you could not live without in the home brewing world today? Uh you know that's a really tough question, but I think. You know, a lot of the techniques I'm using uh, professionally are things that I started doing as a home brewer. And there's no reason that you cannot home brew as great a beer or, you know, the world's greatest beer. Uh, professional brewers do not have, like, some magic piece of equipment or some magic knowledge that enables them to brew better beer than home brewers. That's not the case at all. Uh, actually, the opposite. Home brewers ha- are, have none of the restrictions that professional brewers have. And you should be able to brew the greatest beer in the world. The only thing I would say that is, I have this as a home brewer, but I'm even more adamant about it now as a professional brewer, is if something isn't quite right, if something is not a great beer, Pour it down the down the drain. Um, as a home brewer, I, I would pour beers out that I didn't think were were good. Same here. But I would, you know, I'd be a little bit more lax in that. I'd be like, well, it's not perfect, but you know, that's all right. And I'd serve it to friends. And go, eh, it didn't turn out quite the way I wanted, or I'd drink it. It's like, eh, it's okay. Well, we don't do that commercially. What we do is just like, no, it's not right. It's not perfect. It goes down the drain or it gets distilled or whatever. You can get be. away with a lot more when you're home brewing because, right. I mean, there's yeah. not, I, I'm not charging money anybody, behind it. So, yeah. yeah. Are you going to whine about my, my really good beer that uh, you're getting for free and you're going to complain that really good isn't actually great? Yeah. So I think that's the thing. Is um, you know hold your health, hold yourself to a very high standard that every beer needs to be as close to perfect as you can make it. That to me is is something you know that that's that's our way of doing business. So um, I think I think that may actually tweak me a little bit on the homebrew. All right. You know, when you listen to the show, you can send in your questions, Q&A, label them as Q&A, and send them into Bruce Strong at thebrewingnetwork.com. Or you can have show ideas, like our last Esther show. That was a, a show idea by Matt. He sent it in. He said, show idea, colon, Esther's, to Bruce Strong at thebrewingnetwork.com. And you can participate by listening live at, uh, you know, you do the uh, Bruce uh, uh, BrewingNetwork.com, and you can listen live, and then you can actually participate in the chat. The lovely Miss Bevo is uh, 
uh, moderating that. And she has a question for us. I do. That's from Nate Bruce. Do they have an? Do they? I'm assuming you have an opinion on the amount of dissolved of dissolved oxygen in the mash. I have seen a lot about low do. Wait, what? Is that a thing? Low do brewing yeah, lately? Yeah. Okay. But it looks like a big pain in the butt to even try. Yeah, you know, John, I, I imagine you're, you know, uh, along the same lines of opinion as I am that, uh, yeah. you know, oxygen in the mash isn't a big deal. Um, hot side aeration, it's a thing, but it's if you have great, thing. if you have great fermentation, that pretty much just resolves it all. Um, I I never worried about it at all. Um, John, what about you? Yeah, same opinion. And I think this is one area where I'm a bit of a traditionalist in that um, you know modern brewing equipment and process understanding allows you to. Uh, achieve very low dissolved oxygen in the mash. You mm-hmm. can blanket your, you know, your your brewing process with nitrogen, et cetera, et cetera. Achieve very low oxygen. And people that have tried it, uh, papers, a few papers have been published about it. Say you get, you know, some different character. Uh, they claim a little better character. Well, if it's different, it's not going to necessarily taste traditional. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't taste traditional, then it, you know, I, I'm spoiling, you know, I'm saying it's not really going to taste like the beer that you're used to. Maybe it will be a little bit better, but, um, you know, I, I've honestly, I can only compare it to Zima. (laughs) You know, it's like, (laughs) what are you, what are you really trying to make here with a low DO process? Right. Um, I th- their their original plan was to try to get better shelf life, better shelf stability mm. of traditional beer. Mm-hmm. Um, now you know p- some brewers are taking it and saying, okay, well we can we can get rid of uh, some other flavors and other characters. And it's like, well, you know, I, I don't think you're going to be producing, you know, the the typical kind of beer that you're used to if you do that. Right. I don't. I don't, I don't. I think it's. I think it's you know a bit of chasing your tail. Yep. Chasing a, chasing a fantasy. I'm with you. All right, another fine show. Thank you everybody for participating. Thank you for sending in your questions. Thank you for supporting our fine sponsors like uh, Blickman Engineering. Check them out, BlickmanEngineering.com. Great folks. You can email, and John Blickman will actually read it if you send it to feedback at BlickmanEngineering.com. Tell them how much you enjoy the show. Tell them how much you enjoy the fact that you paid nothing for it, and he paid for the whole darn thing. I think that's pretty cool, and I think John Blickman's pretty cool. Um, if you get a chance to beat him, you'll love him. That and... Uh, Don't forget to check out our other sponsors. Don't forget to check out the Brewing Network store, thebrewingnetwork.com slash store. They've got goodies in there. They've got um, used underwear from Bebo. They've got uh, uh, clocks. They've got uh, (laughs) glassware, T-shirts. They don't have T-shirts? They have T-shirts. I'm still shaking my head at your previous comment. Uh, I'm tired. I don't know. They have socks, or they will they very shortly. Right. Have, I don't think that's a thing, though. We have some new um, uh-huh. bro hats. Yeah, I don't think that's flat a bill thing hats. Either. No, no, I don't think they actually have those. Don't listen to her. I, I think I. No, I, I didn't just spend four days selling them. <laughs> I don't think I'm correct. Those things sell. <laughs> don't listen to her. We sold out of bro hats. Oh my bro! There you go, bro. One ten nine, bro. Very strong. Very strong, everybody. 